Serious what was the dirtiest trick ever pulled in the history of war? During the Second World War, German forces would rig crooked wall paintings to explode when straight and with hopes that it would kill Allied officers when they came in to set up command posts. The logic being that Private Joe Blow clearing the building, looking for enemies isn't going to care or even notice if the painting is askew. But General Robert Important guy who sets up his new command post in the building and is in his office for hours probably would. The Germans also strung piano wire across roads to take out anyone riding by in a jeep. Yup, my gramps told me a story about this. After he was wounded for his third time they made him a career. He was on a motorcycle and because of these piano wires he would always ride hunched over. He lost a small piece of scalp instead of his head when he drove underneath one of these wires. That must have hurt like duck. When Tim of the Lame was about to attack the city of Sivas, he promised the 3000 Christian Armenian Sipahis that he would not shed any of their blood if they surrendered. They did, and, true to his word, he had them all buried alive. Damn, he really out here being true to his word. In World War 1 the Allies became used to the smell of chemical weapons and would put their gas masks on quickly. The Germans changed their tactics and would use nearly odorless vomit inducing chemicals that would absorb quickly into the lungs first. Then, once soldiers were vomiting and couldn't keep their gas masks on, they would fire the main artillery barrage containing the lethal chemicals. I feel like the Great War was the worst war of them all. Conventional weapons chemical weapons, biological weapons, bloody muddy trenches, getting clubbed in the face, as if it were medieval times. Yeah not good. All wars following have been more about ideologies and principles. Not saying wars since have been any better or worse, but at least World War 2 had a reason to fight Germany. The disregard for your own troops is also pretty unreal. Commanders expected heavy losses and planned for human barrages to lead to mass loss of life. Mix in the sheer lack of modern medicine and it's a sh show. Barbaric tactics with near medieval medicine. That kinda thing started with the Napoleonic Wars a century beforehand. World War 1 just took it to a new scale. <laughs> the actor George Sanders found out that his friend, David Niven, was very chummy with Winston Churchill during the war. He asked Niv to give the Prime Minister a note detailing his idea for a new bomb that the RAF could drop on German cities. It would be exactly the same as all the old bombs, except it would have a wind-activated siren attached to it. So when the bombs dropped, the German civilian population hiding in shelters would hear the siren, think that the all-clear was being sounded and come out, just as the bombs hit. Niven didn't say how, Churchill took the idea. Many bombs during World War II on both sides had implemented whistles due to the well-known demoralizing effect it has. In the trenches of France of World War I, General Monash was given with the unenviable task of punching through the German line to claim the French town of Le Hamel. The way that Monash went about doing this was both revolutionary and bloody sneaky. The German forces were well equipped and well fortified, reinforced with heavy artillery and machine guns, and the troops were very well trained. Faced by these odds, Monash began to condition the German forces. Every day at dawn, he would let loose a barrage of smoke bombs followed by mustard gas canisters. The Germans, following their training, would equip themselves with gas masks which protected them. Monash kept up this bombardment for two weeks, and soon the Germans became accustomed to the pattern of attack and would immediately don their gas masks and hunker down at the first sign of smoke. But on the dawn of the 4th of July, the smoke bombs were not followed by gas, but by the Australians. The German gas masks protected them from mustard gas and smoke, but they also vastly impeded their vision, hearing, and ability to communicate with the noise of the battle and the obscuring smoke. They were deaf and blind on the battlefield, and to make things worse, this was not an unprotected infantry massed attack, but a creeping barrage supported by a division of tanks, heavy artillery, and aircraft. The tanks protected the vulnerable infantry, and the artillery and aircraft prevented the Germans from effectively deploying anti-tank measures. The battle was over in just 90 minutes, and marked the rise of mixed arms warfare. That made me think of Scipio Africanus's strategy at the Battle of Ilipa. The Romans and Carthaginians spent the first few days preceding the battle observing and testing each other. Scipio would always wait for the Carthaginians to deploy and advance from their camp before leading out his own troops. 
the Roman formation always presented the legions in the center and the weaker Iberian allies on the wings, leading the Carthaginian commanders, Hasdrubal and Mago, to believe that this would be the Roman arrangement on the day of battle. Believing his deception had taken a firm hold on the Carthaginian commanders, Scipio made his move. First he ordered the army to be fed and armed before daylight. He then promptly sent his cavalry and light missile troops against the Carthaginian outposts at daybreak, while advancing with his main force behind, all the way to the front of the Carthaginian position. That day he posted his legions on the wings and the Iberians in the center. Surprised by the Romans' sudden attack, the Carthaginians rushed to arm themselves and sallied forth without breakfast. Still believing that Scipio would arrange his force in the earlier fashion, Hasdrubal deployed his elite Africans in the center and the Iberian mercenaries on his wings. He was not able to change formation after discovering the new Roman arrangement because the opposing army was too close, as Scipio had ordered his troops to form for battle closer to the Carthaginian camp. Not sure if this counts as a trick, but Napoleon prior to the Battle of Marengo. Not only did he cross the Alps with his entire army, a completely unexpected move, but once across, the Austrians thought Napoleon would move to Genoa in order to relieve the siege of that city. Thousands were dying of starvation, and French General Messina desperately called for Napoleon's aid. Napoleon, in a ruthless and surprising move, ignored the calls for help and instead moved to attack the main portion of the Austrian army, eventually winning the Battle of Marengo. Messina surrendered Genoa, and it would be years before he eventually forgave Napoleon for abandoning him, and it would be years before Napoleon forgave Messina for surrendering. I like how Napoleon expected his general to either die trying or saving the city. Counter-terrorism and anti-crime units have been seeding black market arms dealers with C4 explosive laced ammo. When fired, the bullets tend to have a small explody effect on the weapons, rendering the weapon useless and typically giving the user non-lethal but disfiguring hand and facial injuries. This bad ammo looks and feels like every other bullet that the dealer has sold, so the only solution is to stop using that arms dealer. Now you can't trust your existing arms dealer, and you have to find a new one that may or may not have tainted ammo, or even be a fed. In essence, it shuts down an entire illegal arms industry at the cost of about one or two crates of C4 bullets mixed in with the others. They did that in NAM for a while as well. They would place the ammo on down at Viet Cong soldiers knowing they would loot the body for ammo. They wanted them to distrust the communist ammunition and weapons. The Battle of Majnoon and the iraq iranian War. You wait until night time, and you will see how we are killing these Iranian dogs, an Iraqi officer said with a broad grin. We are frying them like eggplants. He then took us on a tour of dozens of thick electrical cables his troops had lain through the marshy battlefield, a spaghetti network that snaked in and out of the patchwork of lagoons. He showed us the mammoth electric generators that fed the exposed power lines from positions just behind the Iraqi front lines. And, when the Iranian Revolutionary Guards made their regular evening advance, the officer and his men demonstrated the macabre genius of their invention. Iraqi gun batteries fired just enough artillery to force the Revolutionary Guards from their marsh boats, and, when hundreds of them had been forced to continue their advance through the lagoons on foot, the men manning the Iraqi generators flipped a few switches and sent thousands of volts of electricity surging through the marshland. Within seconds, hundreds of Iranians were electrocuted. This occurred nightly. Between this, human wave attacks involving children, to charge positions and clear minefields, and chemical weapons attacks on civilians, the Iran-Iraq war was pretty ducked up. Before the Battle of Yorktown, US Civil War, Confederate General Magruder was able to convince McClellan that he had 40,000 troops manning his defenses, rather than his actual force of approximately 10,000. I Ike. He found a point in the defenses where he knew his troops would be observed and counted, and marched them past that point several times. McClellan had approximately 120,000 troops and superior artillery, but like always, hesitated to attack even with superior numbers. He also thought that another general was approaching with 60,000 men, close to the actual number, and didn't want to attack Magruder's 40,000 and be hit by the 60,000 as well, so he waited for his own reinforcement and more reconnaissance. If he had attacked Magruder, he would have overwhelmed him and been able to prepare for Johnston's arrival. 
Instead, he waited to attack until Magruder's forces were reinforced. Johnston arrived and added even more troops, and the Confederates were eventually able to slip away from the battle with only 300 casualties. Magruder marched troops in a circle past his enemies, making 10,000 men look like 40,000, causing the cautious McClellan to hesitate and waste the opportunity. There's a prevailing sentiment that, if McClellan wasn't so cautious, the Civil War could have been won in 1861. His waiting and retreating, and not pursuing retreats, to prevent casualties had the South time to mobilize and present a strong military threat, instead of cutting through them like the hot knife they were through the South's proverbial butter. His refusal to attack and sustain high casualties in his own army over a shorter period of time led to the rise of Grand Hoss' entire plan was to sustain high casualties until the South collapsed economically. <laughs> Dirtiest trick that was conceived but not used was British scientists formulating a plan of dropping anthrax laced linseed cakes into cattle fields as a bionuk of sorts once it worked up the food chain. After initial experiments destroyed pretty much all life on the island they used, they decided that possibly killing off everything in continental Europe probably wasn't a good idea. According to the wiki, the government didn't plan on even cleaning the test island up until a group of scientists dropped off contaminated soil at a military research facility and threatened to make further drops in order to ensure the rapid loss of indifference of the government and the equally rapid education of the general public. Terrorism wins again. But the threat was issued in 1981, and cleanup didn't start until 1986. I clean up chemical slash biological spills and soil for a living, and while this is a bit long, it's not that unusual for a multi-million job like that would have been. Let's say it took a year for someone to actually officially decide that yes, this is a problem. It then takes at least a year to get funding, 9 months to properly write up the job for public tendering. Another half year to let the companies fill in the tender. Three months to pick someone. Half a year to write do all the planning. Another half year for permits. These overlap a bit, so call it nine months. Then the fun fun process of actually getting your gear, mobilizing your infrastructure, because abandoned island, that's hard working. And then it's 1986, and we can move the first shovel full of dirt. The Russians and their use of a scorched earth policy. I can't think of a better way to flip off your invaders than ruining all your own shit so, when they do take it, it's worthless. Not only that, but the land itself is just too damn cold. So go ahead, take the land. You will just freeze to death. Congratulations. Russia also gets to enjoy a strategy almost no one else gets to enjoy, retreating because there's so much land vs their neighbors. The enemy must advance and stretch out their supply lines, while Russia shortens their supply lines. The hard part for the Russians was always having any supplies to send out. I'm watching the Great War YouTube channel on World War 1 and there was a really interesting comment about Romania joining the war on the side of the Entente. It sounds like a good thing, but Russia actually saw Romania as a liability. Romania had men. But their supplies were shit. They weren't trained well, had archaic weaponry and almost no heavy artillery, etc. So now Russia has to take care of this new ally and not let them get their ass kicked lest the aunt aren't lose morale. Problem is Russia never had a shortage of men. They had a shortage of modern equipment and supplies. The generals rarely asked for more men, but they constantly asked for heavy guns and ammunition. So basically, Romania brought nothing to the table for Russia besides distraction of Central Powers forces and a wider front for strategic engagement. I found it interesting how a country like Russia could gain an ally, but it's not even a net positive. <laughs> Maybe not the dirtiest, but according to my point of view a very unethical trick. Near the end of the Great War, Italy and Austria signed a contract of peace on the 3rd November 1918. The Austrians thought that the contract was valid from the moment the signature was written, but in fact it the contact became valid on the several days after the, the 3rd of November. But the Austrian troops have already started to travel back home, thus South Tyrol was unprotected. The Italian army recognized that and silently invaded South Tyrol. The dirty trick comes now. An Italian Namanet or Tilomi always wanted South Tyrol to become a part of Italy, so he translated the names of very common locations into the Italian language. Then he presented his map the Allies, claiming that South Tyrol had previously been a part of Italy. Due to that lie South Tyrol was promised to Italy in the Treaty of London. 
Since then our small region is a part of Italy. <laughs> Subscribe and leave a like. Please.